Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Conference. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I came to the first conference. The first one I went to was in 2012, where I met Monica and uh, entered this world of the Hemisterectomy Foundation and all of you wonderful families. It was, um, at the time when I came, um, my name is Luke Shepard, and my daughter is Alexis Shepard. She's out here, so she's probably in kids' camp. When we came, she, it was before she had her surgery, and it was just amazing to me to uh, meet several other families who had gone through the experience, and it really demystified it and made it approachable for me. And so I got involved with Monica and was really excited to try and make sure that this conference expanded and that we were able to uh, spur the research that really uh, drives the outcomes for all of our kids. Um, my daughter had her surgery three years ago, and she's now eight and uh, doing great, and I'm, she's excited to be here today. Um, this conference could not happen without the work of so many people. Um, I want to, in particular, thank our three premier level sponsors. Um, it's the Hemisterectomy Foundation, has, was the organization that I saw when I first was looking around for this um, years ago, and they've been a strong partner with uh, the Brain Recovery Project for so many years, so thank you so much to the Hemisterectomy Foundation for sponsoring. Um, I also want to thank Laventure Products, which is a premier level sponsor. You want to stand up? <laughs> Just stand up. Okay, thank you so much for the sponsorship here. And then, um, and, and UCB, who's the pharmaceutical company who makes Briviact and Keppra. Keppra, uh, my daughter had Keppra for several years, and it was just a miracle for uh, a while. You know, in the end, of course, she had her surgery. Um, and they're outside, and uh, I think they are just an enormous help as well. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, and of course, I want to thank Monica Jones, who's put together this whole conference and really made things possible. And finally, anyone who's volunteered, all of you families who came, and everybody who's worked together to make this possible, it's, it's a, a groundbreaking conference. And uh, yesterday, we had, um, if you look around, you can see some posters from this one-day conference we had yesterday discussing where we should go for research outcomes um, and what we need to do to advance the state of the field. Um, the keynote yesterday was Dr. Kolb, who's going to speak in a moment. Uh, Dr. Kolb is incredible. He literally wrote the book on neuropsychology, and he's been doing decades of research on neuroplasticity and how it can affect the brain, how we can grow and, and develop, especially for our kids. And I know he's been working with uh, Monica and the Brain Recovery Project for years and has been a, just a tremendous ally. And thank you so much, Dr. Kolb. And I'd like to uh, welcome you and come on up, and uh, I'm excited to hear your talk. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Um, I thought I should start with one little anecdote. Uh, my job here is not to blow you away, and I know with some younger people this may not be as accessible as your uh, home classroom teacher. But anyway, who, who named Rasmussen's encephalitis? You probably don't know. Well, it was do Dr. Rasmussen. And I was a, a fellow at the Montreal Neurological Hospital, and he was there. I, I didn't know him well, but I got to know him. But one of the things that startled me was <clears throat> the neurosurgical residents kept talking about hot lips. And I said, who is hot lips? Oh, it's Dr. Rasmussen. And I said, why is he called that? He played the trumpet to get through medical school. And so that's who he was. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago uh, living out in Calgary. Now, a lot of you have no idea where Lesbridge is, and I don't blame you. So I'm from Western Canada. If you've heard of Montana, we're about 20 minutes from the Montana border and about 25 minutes from the British Columbia border. So that's where it is. Okay, so let's talk about harnessing uh, neuroplasticity, how the brain learns. So the, the key point that I want to make here is that we live in a society uh, that's dependent upon the brain. Your brain is you, but hardly anybody knows anything about it. When I took my first course on the brain in 1966, I can tell you that about 95% of what I learned was wrong. 
And hopefully what I'm telling you today is not wrong, uh, that we've come a long way in 40 some years. Understanding how the brain changes with experience um, is crucial to education, how we educate our kids, to health, and to public policies. Okay. The term neuroplasticity is a relatively new term, but we were chatting this morning, and it's, not, it's an old idea. The, the idea is that the brain changes when you learn. If you're gonna learn anything, the brain has to change, okay? Because it's somehow, if I teach you anything this morning, and even this afternoon you can recall something of it, it means I got in your brain and I tweaked it. I changed your brain. So I'm responsible for messing you up. So the idea is that experience changes the brain <clears throat> and therefore it changes behavior. So in order to change behavior, we must change the brain. The corollary of that is, is if uh, behavior cha changes, the brain must have changed, but also behavior changes the brain. Imagine learning to play tennis. You're out there playing tennis, you're not thinking, gotta change my brain. You're thinking, I gotta make this stroke correctly. In order to make that stroke correctly, the brain has to change. So. What's changing? So these are neurons. You've got 86 billion of these little guys. They're just, I spent a lot of time looking in a microscope at uh, creatures like this. As you can see, let's see if this cursor is going to work. Yeah, um, it's very complicated. This is the cell body, and these things coming out are called dendrites. And on the dendrites are these little spines, these little, like rose bush spines. So I want you to imagine this to be a tree, a great big tree and the tree has lots of leaves on it, okay? So the leaves would be at these little points. The leaves contact what? They contact the sun. Well, these little uh, things in neurons contact other neurons, okay? So these are where synapses occur. So the number of synapses on these neurons reflects the way in which this brain is, is changing for good, or unfortunately at time for bad. So here's, here's a neuron, now it's a cartoon. Here's a neuron, there's that cell body. It's got these connections coming in to those little spiny creatures. Now, let's suppose that we have some learning experience. Let's go back to tennis. You're learning how to play tennis and you're actually getting the stroke right finally. Uh, what's happening is you're adding new connections and you're changing the connections that are already there. Okay, so you're, this is what plasticity is about. So here's another neuron. This is a neuron from a different part of the brain. It's a little longer, but it's the same general thing. So we can estimate the number of connections that a cell has by measuring the length of the branches. So imagine, here's your job. Great big tree here, and your uh, little girl says, Daddy, I wonder how many leaves are on that tree? And you say, well, we can't count them. There's too many, but we have a way of doing this. If we could estimate how long all the branches were, and we knew how far apart the leaves were, we could tell how many leaves are on the tree, right? It's just a simple uh, mathematical thing. And so we can do the same thing with these neurons. We can actually measure how long all of these branches are, and we can determine how far apart these connections or these uh, spines are, and therefore tell how many connections there are in that cell. So we can measure how the, the connections go up and down. Why do you care? Well, let me give you an example. I'm gonna give you crack cocaine. Not going to give you, but pretend I'm going to give you uh, crack cocaine. And your behavior might change. In fact, it's going to change. And so the question is, well, why is that? Why is there a change in your behavior? And why doesn't it go away? Why do we have this chronic effect of taking these psychoactive drugs? Well, because the structure of the, of the neurons involved uh, have changed. And so if you think about, okay, well, let's suppose you become addicted to, to nicotine. Nicotine is, as many of you know, really a powerful addictive substance. So why is it that it's addictive? What's, what's going on here? There's a region of the brain, these names aren't going to mean much, but uh, this little place in the brain, which is called nucleus accumbens, it's part of what's known as the basal ganglia. Here it is, here. And if we look at this neuron and compare it to this neuron, I hope visually you can see that this one has more of those dendrites than this one. And you might gonna say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like the neuron that you showed before. No, it's a different kind of neuron, but the principle is exactly the same. All right, so if we give you, in this case it's amphetamine, daily, a fairly, relatively small dose for two weeks, and then we wait for four months or four years and look in the brain, what we're going to see is this increase in the number of connections here, about 40% increase. Now, you're gonna say, is that good or bad? Well, it's neither, it's, it, it's just what happens. But other parts of the brain show the reverse effect, and that is 
uh, just change the labels and the amphetamine is gonna make the cells simpler. So you can see, we're, oops, we're seeing this widespread uh, alteration in the general organization. So as we learn different things, and, and taking a drug is basically a form of learning, I should mention, and I'll come back to it, that every psychoactive drug that you take, unfortunately one of them I'm addicted to, which is caffeine, um, has a change in the brain that is relatively permanent. It's a footprint that's there. I wouldn't worry about it. It's just a thing. Um, but it, it passes um, from mom to, to offspring if, if the drugs are consumed uh, while you're pregnant, so there's a reason not to be consuming drugs um, other than caffeine, he says, uh, <laughs> when you're pregnant. But certainly drugs like nicotine or, or cocaine or, or morphine or whatever are not, not good for the developing brain. Okay, so as we learn different tasks or different skills, different regions of the brain change. So Pete, student, my students will say, where's learning? And my response is, learning's everywhere. It's not in a place in the brain, it is the brain. So here's an example of two tests that you can give. These are rats. So this rat has to learn. Imagine this. There's a giant in the room. The giant comes and picks you up and throws you in the middle of a swimming pool. There's no ladder out. What are you going to do? After you go, oh, oh. Uh, you're going to start swimming around. And eventually, you bump into a platform that you can stand up on. And so this rat swims around. This platform is under the surface of the water. It gets up on the platform. And you do the same thing and go, I wonder where I am. And you look around like this, okay? The giant returns. The giant comes back, picks you up, throws you back in the pool, and what do you do? You look around and you say, I was over there, and you swim to the platform. So that's a form of learning. So you've learned where things are in the world. Here's a different rat. She's learning how to reach through this slot. You can't see it too well in this angle. But she's reaching through this to get a sugar-coated pellet, okay? And they naturally, like we, like little sugary things. And so the rat will learn this rather rapidly. This requires a different part of the brain. So learning this task requires a different part of the brain to change than learning this task. Here's another example. Here's two monkeys. Whoops, don't do that. Here's two monkeys. So this monkey is learning to get food out of a tiny little food well, and it has to go like this to get it out. This other monkey has, to, it has a big food well, and it grabs the food like this. Okay, so imagine the difference. This versus this. So what's the difference in my movement? I'm moving a digit, I'm moving my wrist, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look in the monkey's brain and see how much of the monkey's brain is occupied by making this movement or this movement. And the, um, you can see here the red is moving like this and the green is moving like this. So the monkey who learned with the little hole has a different organization of the motor cortex than the monkey who learned this. Well, how is that relevant to real life? Let's suppose you're trying to learn how to play the guitar or the piano or any instrument. You've got to do a lot of this or a lot of this, right? So you're going to be changing like this. But if you had to do other things, I'm going to make this up because I have no idea whether it's true or not, but pretend it is. Uh, if I'm playing tennis, I'm not doing this. I'm making movements like this. We're going to see changes more like that. Now, you might say, oh, so does learning to play tennis interfere with learning how to play the violin? I hope not, but one could reach that conclusion. Okay, the developing brain is rather uh, a remarkable thing. When, when I took uh, my first course in the brain, as I said, in 1966, the idea was when you're born, you have this brain, and it, what happens is it gets bigger as you get bigger. It's the same brain. We know that's not true. When you're born, your brain is very different from the brain that you have when you're uh, 30 years old. So why would you have a brain that's changing so much? Well, because it, it, you, can't, you can't have a blueprint for a brain. It's not like uh, making a liver. So here's what happens. You've got 86 billion neurons, brain cells in the brain, and they're going to be 10 to the 14th connections. That's a lot of zeros, trillions and trillions of connections in the brain. What you do in order to solve this problem, if you're Mother Nature, is to say, oh, I can't have a blueprint for this thing, because if I'm born in Cleveland versus being born on the North Pole, the environment I'm in is not going to be the same. So what I have to do is I have to be ready. I don't know what, I'm going to pop up in the world and go, where am I? And so what uh, Mother Nature said was, let's make a brain that's twice as big as we need and get rid of half of it. Now you're going to say, a baby's head's tiny. 
Yeah, BB's head's tiny, but the number of neurons in that brain is twice as many as I have now. And so what the brain does is it makes these uh, neurons and it makes the connections, and then once it's in the environment, it starts getting rid of them. Now imagine that you've got some sort of neurological condition early on. Pardon me. <coughs> you have this neurological condition, so the experience the brain has is different than if you don't have it. So the way in which the brain starts shedding those connections is going to differ depending on um, the condition that your brain is in, which, which many of you have seen, the behaviors are somewhat different. Okay, so if we look here, here's a brain at 25 days. There's no brain, really, uh, gestation, and it's getting bigger and bigger. It starts to look like a human brain around seven months. At birth, at nine months, it really doesn't look like an adult brain, but I'm telling you that it's got twice as many cells as you have as an adult now. Here's what's happening. Where, um, the cells are really simple in the newborn, and they get more and more complex. So by two years, these cells are very complicated. But now we've got to start getting rid of them. So if you look here, these are cells from the visual cortex, which is the stuff at the back. It's er early developing stuff. So we have, this is the number of connections. Um, at birth, there's not very many, and it goes zoom. So by year one, it's uh, very high, and then what you start doing is getting rid of them. Well, the visual cortex is really straightforward. It's a relatively simple. The stuff at the front of your brain, and I'm gonna talk about it more than once, is called prefrontal cortex. And it's a really dumb term, because pre means before. So prefrontal would be before the front. Well, that would be out here somewhere, right? It's not out here somewhere. It's just a term that was given in the 1800s and it's still there. So anyway, this, this stuff here develops very slowly. So this figure is going to look a little complicated. It's not really. It's the same as the visual one. This is the number of, con of uh, connections, basically, spine density. And you see this increase peaking around age five and then dropping. And the major drop occurs during... Uh, pre-adolescence and adolescence. So what's that mean? You've got a brain that reaches its peak and its connections here at age five. It sits around waiting. And then when adolescence comes, it says, okay, it's time to start changing. And so when it's changing, it's getting rid of about 100,000 synapses per second. 100,000 gone, 100,000 gone, 100,000 gone, 100,000 gone. Any of you who've had a 12-year-old girl, I'll say no more, you know um, what's happening is there's rapid change, because in, in girls rather than boys, you get this sudden surge of hormones. The boys have had them all along, so it's not as dramatic. And there are dramatic changes in the behavior of these kids. I had two younger sisters. I got to see it. I have a daughter. I got to see it in a different way, and it's rather uh, remarkable. And what you see is that, of course, the behavior of, of the child is changing rapidly. And I can recall, I mentioned this in my talk yesterday, but I'll say it again. I can remember going to bed with my wife and saying, why did we get involved in this? We have a monster in the house. And the next morning, somebody else shows up for breakfast and you go, oh, that's not so bad. She spent all night getting rid of all these connections. Okay, so these connections are changing. But let's think about this. You've got to, uh, well, let's pick on girls because I'm not one. Um, <laughs> it's easier. Uh, imagine a, a young girl in grade seven, let's say, or grade eight, the peak time of all these changes, and they're in a social group. This social group is a very nasty group. You all know that. The, the dynamics are really very difficult, and kids have a lot of trouble um, adjusting to this, and, and the Facebook and all these things cause more problems. But what's happening is the social environment they're in is rapidly affecting how these synapses are lost. Okay, and as parents, we need to be aware of that. Okay, this, this social group is doing things. We've got to do things, too, in order to, to make, make this better. So if we look at adolescence, it's a time, it's a unique time. So this is plasticity, how plastic the brain is. And I've put 14.5 here, which is a little older than it's happening in girls. I'm sort of averaging girls and boys. At this point, we have really rapid change. What you do not want your kids to be doing at that age is smoking dope. I've already told you that drugs are changing the brain. If the drugs are changing the brain and the brain's changing really fast, you can predict that whatever changes occur here are not like the ones that occur here. And that is true. Okay, if you were trying to figure out where the brain and how the brain learns, where would you start? 
And I tell my students all the time, the place to start with everything is with questions. The questions you're going to ask is where is this occurring? So what happens when the brain learns? Where does this happen? And are there age differences? So what happens when the brain learns? I have these in the wrong order. So what really happens first is we have a change in gene expression. So for many of you, this is going to be a strange concept. But you know that the cells that make up your skin, your brain, your bones, your eye, your hair, all have the same DNA in them. But the cells aren't the same. So why is that? Because different genes, you've got 20-some thousand genes, different ones are turned on or off. So the ones that make the fingernail are different than the ones that make your eye, okay, in terms of gene expression. So gene expression uh, determines what the cell does. So gene expression determines which proteins are made. So proteins are the building blocks of, of connections. So we, we see changes in gene expression. We also see, um, don't, it's really sensitive. Uh, we see changes um, in what's called neurogenesis. So normally we used to think that um, by about seventh month's gestation, no more new cells in the brain were made. If you lose them, tough luck. We know that's not true now. We know that new neurons are made. That's called neurogenesis. In fact, new neurons must be made if you think about it, how many things do you learn in your life? You can't imagine how many things you learn in your life. Do you remember them all? No. So one of the reasons we are able to keep learning new things is because we're able to get rid of old things. And one of the ways we get rid of old things is we grow new neurons and we get rid of some of the neurons we don't need and that results in a new network in the brain. That's neurogenesis. Okay. So the conclusion here is learning results from structural changes. The structure of the brain is actually changing, just like it did when we gave the rat amphetamine. And many of these changes involve changes in the nucleus of the neurons. So what's forgetting? If you forget, what happens? Those changes must be lost. And I have a metaphor that I, I find useful with my undergraduates. Imagine Jack and Jill. They go up this hill, they got a pail of water, and Jack dumps the, the um, pail of water at the top of the hill. What happens? Does the water just go down as a sheet? No. It forms little rivulets, right? Little channels. Jill's at the bottom. She collects all the water, gives it to Jack. He goes back to the top, dumps it again, and guess what? The water takes the same route it took the first time. And it, so you could say, oh, the water remembered how to get down the hill, OK? It, it's a little loose metaphor, okay, but that's the idea. Now, it turns out that Craig has a little dump truck, and that night he comes over and he starts playing on the hill with his dump truck, and so he messes up those rivulets. Jack pours the water the next day, and it doesn't take the same route. The water didn't remember the route. So basically what I'm saying is that forgetting is a loss of that change in structure in the brain for whatever reason, other experiences and so on. So that's what forgetting would be. So to relearn things, you've got to get that original rivulets back again. It's a, it's a loose metaphor, but I hope that works for you. Is all learning the same? No. There are many kinds of memory. This looks complex, but it isn't really. So we'll, we'll say that there's uh, four times here, there's four types rather, there's explicit memory. So if I say to you, tell me something that happened to you last week, something that happened to you last week, not something that happened last week. You could say, well, you know, I went shopping at Walmart or I did this and I bought that or whatever. That's called episodic memory. It's an episode in your life. It's, it's biographical. That's a different kind of memory than facts. If I say, um, who was John F. Kennedy? That's a fact. That's got nothing to do with you. I'm guessing that none of us in this room met John F. Kennedy. We have no episodes with him except on TV uh, and so on. So that's a different kind of memory. Here's another kind called implicit memory, and that is um, we learn skills. We learn habits. We learn how to, to drive a car. Those of us who can drive a car, if I said to you, I don't want to know when you started to drive a car, because you can probably remember that first time that didn't go well, but when do you think you actually knew how to drive a car? Oh, I don't know. I just all of a sudden knew how. That's a habit. That's a totally different kind of memory. Now, we can have different forms of memory loss related to these different uh, kinds of memory, and we also have emotional memories. We also have memories that are very short, short-term memory, and I'm going to call those working memories. So I'm going to give you a phone number, 320-1053, and I'm going to say, remember this, and you'll say, okay, and you can hold it in your memory. If I asked you tomorrow, you'd say, yeah, you mentioned some phone number, but I didn't know and I don't remember it. 
That's, that's a short-term memory. You've got no reason to remember that, except that it's my phone number. Without the area code, you can't call me, so we're safe. <laughs> okay, so where does this happen? It happens in a lot of places, but one of the things that happens, I'm going to have, I want you to remember a face. So think of a face. Think of your mother's face, for example, if she's not here, if your grandmother's face. Um, and you, you can have a picture in your mind of that face. Well, where is that? It's a memory of that face. It must be in a region of the brain that processes faces. Okay, so there, as you see a face, it's processed in a particular part of the brain. Okay, that's great. Now, now what? Well, this face is associated with all sorts of things. So think of grandma. You think of her face, but you think of how she smells, you think of how she moves, you think of what she talks about and so on. So there's lots of things associated with that face, and that's going on in different parts of the brain. It's not all in one spot. So what you've got is basically a network in the brain that puts all this stuff together. We call this the binding problem. It bind together all those things about grandma. So it, it's not just one, one uh, fact that we're remembering here. This is called a network. Two parts of the brain that are especially important are one called the hippocampus. This is it's, uh, Greek for uh, seahorse, because it kind of looks like a seahorse in the, in the human brain, not in other brains and prefrontal cortex I've already mentioned. So what's, where's the hippocampus? It's in the temporal lobe. It's right here. It's this, well, I'm going to call it bluey green uh, structure. And in cross section down here, you can see there it is. Okay, so if you have a hemispherectomy or a temporal lobectomy, you're likely to have this removed. I'm going to tell you right now that this is an important structure for memory. It's different on the two sides of the brain. So one might anticipate that there's going to be some memory impairment if you lose it, and in fact there is. Uh, this is the prefrontal regions. There's a whole bunch of prefrontal regions. The different regions don't matter very much. The point is that the prefrontal cortex is involved in different kinds of memories. One of them is the biographical memory, remembering what happened to you last week when you went to Walmart, blah, blah. Um, another, so you, if a patient who is damaged there, uh, in certain regions, they're in fact right here, uh, you can say, uh, can you tell me what happened to you in grade 8? Well, I went to such and such school. No, but what happened to you in grade 8? And they can't tell you. They can tell you facts about being in grade 8, but not anything autobiographical. That's very different than having damage to the hippocampus where you wouldn't remember where you went. Okay, totally different kinds of memory. Okay, so these regions play a um, different role. Now, one of the things here that's interesting, my dad had Parkinson's disease. And one of the effects of Parkinson's disease is certain kinds of memory problems. And I remember being stunned one day. I was visiting him, him and my mom, and he was really upset about something. And I, and I could hear him cursing. He used to work in the oil field, so that they learned to behave that way. Right? And so anyway, so I, I said, what's going on? And he said, I must be going crazy. And I said, OK, and the, your evidence of that is, I can't figure out how to turn the lights off. I've been doing it my whole life. Well, what is that? kind of memory is that? That's a habit. It's got something to do with the switch. And he went, why didn't I remember that? And I said, you have Parkinson's disease, and what you have is a loss of habit memory. That went mm -hmm. right past. Um, and it would have on me, too, if I was his age and someone told me that. But he had, he had a form of amnesia, but it was nothing like what you think of an am as amnesia. He could remember facts. He could re tell you all the world events, but he couldn't remember how to turn off the light switch. He couldn't remember how to turn off the radio. And I saw him later, and he was using the channel changer at the radio. And I said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I can't figure out how to turn this off. I know it turns off the TV. OK, so that's a form of a different form of memory loss. So we're going to see that depending on what regions of the brain are dysfunctional, we have different forms of memory impairment. OK, so memories are stored in networks. I've already said that. Are there age differences in how and where learning occurs? Yes, because remember, the brain is changing during development. It's change I didn't say this, but the brain is changing up until about age 30 at least. And so you're shedding neurons until age 30. And if I asked you, uh, if you're over 30, over 40 ideally, um, when did you become you? Most women would say, oh, 28, 30. And most men would say 30, 32. And after that, I'm pretty much the same, and that's probably true, because the brain has continued to change up until that age. So if we look at children, we, can, we know that we're uh, shedding connections, so the brain is different at different ages. Therefore, the processes involved in learning are going to be different. And in addition, 
we know that it, the, the different regions of the brain develop at different rates. So here's an experiment. Here's a little, I don't know, boy or girl. We'll say girl. Um, and um, here's the task. You've got um, this pyramid is covering a uh, jelly bean. So what she has to do is to move the jelly bean, so, you know, remove the pyramid. She gets the jelly bean, and then she has to remember that she went to the jelly bean. So 20 seconds later, we're going to give her a choice between a pyramid and a cylinder. And she has to choose the a cylinder. This is called delayed non match to sample. Take one that wasn't the one you had before. Okay? A monkey, exactly the same task. And if we look at uh, developing uh, children, they find this extraordinarily difficult. You would find this easy. You learn this task in 15 seconds. You go, oh, I get this. I have to choose whatever I didn't choose before. Okay, here's a different task. This one's much harder to us. Here's um, a pair of objects, so a, a cube and a circle-y thing. Um, and the cube is always correct. And so you get 20 pairs of these, and they're all different. And then we do it day after day, and we eventually learn it, okay? Which one will those young kids learn faster? Which task? This one they learn faster than the delayed non-matched to sample, whereas we're the reverse. Why is that? It must be that the region of the brain that's learning this is developing faster than the region of the brain that was learning how to do the other task, and that's exactly what's happening. So we have different rates of brain maturation, and that is reflected um, in, the, in the learning that the kids do. So the uh, second task is called a concurrent discrimination. It's a, Jargony word, don't worry about that. Um, but they can learn that faster than the matching task. So it, the basal ganglia, remember I showed you the place involved in addiction, the nucleus accumbens, is involved in learning that task, the concurrent task, and areas of the cortex, this wrinkly stuff outside, is involved in learning the others. So the, the rate of learning at different ages depends on the maturity of different parts of the brain. But look at it another way. If development is abnormal, for some reason or other, some neurological developmental disorder, you in fact might see the reverse. You might see that kids would have a lot of trouble learning the concurrent task, but in fact could learn the non-matched sample task fast. So you see these counterintuitive symptoms at times. The implication here is that young children and adolescents don't learn the same way. Okay, what factors are influencing learning? Early experience has a huge impact. Here's an interesting study by Hart and Risley. What they did was they simply put a uh, microphone in the home, and they, two hours a day, just had, had the tape recorder on in the house, and they simply recorded um, the number of words that children were exposed to, and then they measured how many, what the vocabulary was. So at, at age 12, it was zero. But you can see this rapid increase in the number of words kids know. And you've got one group of kids who at age three have about 1,200 words, and another group at the same age who have maybe 400 words, that's a huge difference. What they also showed is that if you come back eight years later and look at these kids, these kids continue to increase the vocabulary at that rate and these kids at that rate. And in fact, these kids have a larger vocabulary than the mums of these kids. This has got nothing to do with IQ, uh, as you're going to see. So what's going on here? In New Zealand, they did a study in which they took kids and did something similar to what I just said. They measured um, reading ability at age five, and then again at, at age 15. What they discovered was the kids who were the best readers at age five are still the best readers at 15. The kids who had trouble at age five are bad at age 15. Teachers don't like this because it means the teachers didn't do anything for these kids. The trajectory going on here is already set. What's this trajectory related to? Can we change it? The answer is yes. Um, but um, it's related to socioeconomic status. Oh, you mean how, how much money you have determines how fast your kids learn vocabulary? Sort of, but it's not the way you might think. So the number of words sp spoken to a child can be done in two ways. One way is to have them just listen to the words. The other one is what I'm going to call a serve and return manner. I'm going to um, look at the child and say, okay, uh, what did you do in school today? and the child can respond back. And we have this back and forth conversation that I'm gonna call serve and return. Actually having eye contact and touch is really important. 
There was an interesting study trying to teach kids how to speak Japanese, and they had two ways of doing it. One was to have two TV sets, not the kind we have now, but the old kind that were this deep, and big cathode ray tube. Took the, the uh, tube out of one of them and had a lady in there looking at the kid, um, trying to teach them the words. The other one was the same lady on the TV. Now, the lady that's actually there, she can follow you, right? Because you're the baby, you're looking around, I'm bored with this. And she says, well, look over here. And so we have this back and forth conversation, whereas the other one is on TV. Which kids learn Japanese? Not the ones watching TV. Even though they heard the same words, you have to have this serve and return um, um, interaction in order to get this vocabulary to increase. So why would low SES parents have less of this? Because they're busier. They may have two jobs, they may have got all sorts of things going on, and so they don't have as much time to have this interaction and actually don't know that, that that's important. So by age four, the low SES kids have heard 30, fewer, 30 million fewer words directed directly to them. That's a huge deficit to make up. You've got to start it sooner. And that's why those kids in New Zealand, by age five, they'd heard a lot fewer words directed at them, and so they have this deficit that persists because it, cha it doesn't change. All right, it's possible to change this, and, and the grammar is different too. Okay, so if we look at the language areas of the brain, there are regions of the brain involved in language. These are the ones, some of them that have this color here, red or, or um, yellow. Um, those regions are smaller in the kids who didn't get this serve and return exposure to words. And that's the reason that their um, language skills are not as good. The cutoff in this study, there's a couple of studies, is around $30,000 a year. But what I'm going to tell you is the, the money is irrelevant. The emphasis, it's not that uh, SES determines your destiny, but it's the environment. So how can we look at that? So the OECD has a, a test of literacy. And what they can do is give us all this test of literacy, and there'll be five levels of literacy. Five being the highest, one being the lowest, okay? So it's the capacity, you can see it, to identify, understand, and blah, blah, uh, using written words. And this is what the OECD calls literacy. In the United States, about 50% of the American adults are at levels one or two, low, the low end of literacy. They have trouble understanding a variety of things. Even though they went through to grade 12, they were actually not literate um, 10 years later because they're not using it. So the question, 30% of Swedes are at this level. Does this mean Swedes are, are smarter than Americans? No. What it means is that the exposure to words is different in the Swedes than the Americans. And that's because the school system is different. The preschool system is different. OK. Well, let's look at a country that's really poor, but it has the best literacy in the Americas. And I can tell you right now, it's not the United States. It's not Canada. It's Cuba. So why are the Cuban kids so smart compared to American kids? Well, Castro was really interested in children. So the revolution was in 61, and they set up what are called polyclinics in the 70s. So a pregnant woman, when she discovers that she's pregnant, goes to the clinic every month, and then towards the end, every two weeks, there's a nurse there, and the clinics are attached to schools. So they're getting this home care, sorry, this personal care, prenatal care, uh, and then the, once children are born, there's this program called Educate Your Child where the children are being taught words and so on in the way I just described. Um, and what happens is they do way better. So here's a study, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Cuba, and Mexico looking at grade three language scores. And you can see the richest countries in Latin America um, have a mean here, and the Cubans are out here. Now as a Canadian, I thought, well, yeah, but you know, they're all Hispanics. Yeah. Us, us guys in Canada, uh, we're much better than them. You know where we are? Right on this line. We're, and you would be the same. The US and Canada are exactly the same. Here are these Cuban kids. Let's take the program that those Cuban kids got and move it to the United States. That's been done in South Carolina with disadvantaged kids, and guess what? This is how they turn out. So in fact, the SES isn't determining your destiny, it's the environment you're in that's determining it. You need to have this kind of environment where you're having the serve and return interaction with the children. Okay, early experiences affect learning. Stress affects learning. So when we think of stress, we think, you know, God, I have an exam next week, this is really stressful, or we have no money, or whatever it is. But there's more kinds of stress than that. 
We can have stress that occurs postnatally in adults or in children or in utero, or I think some of the most interesting things are stress that occurs to your father before you're conceived. What's that got to do with me? Everything. We have transgener transgenerational effects of stress. So we're going to call it preconceptual stress. So we're going to take uh, a rat or a, a mouse or a cat or a human, and we're going to stress the dad. And then the dad's going to mate with your mom. And even if you never met your dad, his history of, of stress is going to influence who you are. This is a transgenerational effect. And I tell my students, um, girls, when you're thinking about getting married, I think you should have a little bit of an idea as to what your husband was doing for the last six months because it's going to have an impact on your kids. And if it wasn't good, you better make sure it's good for the next six months before you think about having kids because it's going to impact how your kids develop. And it turns out your grandkids. It crosses generations. Here's a rat study. So this rat, dad, the effect of dads is bigger than, than moms on this. It's surprising. Here's this rat. It's, it's uh, learning how to reach for food. Um, the details don't matter, but this is how accurate they are. So a rat that's dad was uh, not stressed has a uh, score here. Of, I can't read it. I think it's about 80% accuracy. And one that had, whose dad was stressed, he never met his dad, um, has a significantly lower motor skills. It's crossing generations. And in fact, this is equivalent to having perinatal ischemia, the, the difference. Psychoactive drugs, I've already alluded to that, and the point here is that every psychoactive drug is producing a change in the brain. And the changes in the brain, if it's gestational exposure, are actually very large. So the, drain, the um, brain is changed by drugs, but the question is, so what? Does that have any effect? Well, it does. So here's an experiment. We're going to put rats in these complex environments. I'm going to call these rat condominiums. They live in groups. They have lots of toys that are put in regularly. Toys is a loose word here. Uh, toys put in there, they get different kinds of foods and so on. It's a really enriched environment for them. And their IQ goes up significantly and stays up forever. OK, let's do it again. And now we're going to give them drugs. And we've used nicotine. We've used um, cannabis. We've used um, uh, cocaine. We've used amphetamine and so on. Give them the drugs. Wait for four months, which if you're a rat is a long time. They only live two years and then put them in this complex environment. Does the IQ go up? The answer is, well, there's three possibilities. It doesn't matter. It still goes up. Or the experience of the drug only um, affects the regions of the brain that were affected by the drug, or it changes the whole brain. And the answer is the last one. The experience of that drug, regardless of what it was, blocks the later effect of that complex environment. Think about what this means. Let's go back to the 14-year-old boy and his friends are um, doping up every day on, on cannabis, let's say. And now they're in high school. Who's going to learn better, them or their friends who did not have those drugs? You know the answer to this. So it reduces plasticity later in life. Now, we think we can reverse it, but the point is that we, we need to know that this is going on. So these, these early experiences are affecting uh, learning later. Um, one example, and as you may know, Canada has legalized cannabis, so one of our worries is um, we don't want this making it easier for 14-year-old kids to be smoking dope or eating it or whatever. Um, sleep. Sleep is really important, as we know, but why is it important? Why do we sleep? Because we're tired, and that's not the right answer. Um, we sleep because that's a time that the brain is not being uh, bombarded with new information, and it actually can produce these circuits. So the changes that are, occur, occur, that are, are required for learning are occurring when you have REM sleep or dream sleep. Uh, that's what it's doing. Play. Play is huge. So here are two rats. All mammals play. So there's two rats here, and when they play, they're just the same as kittens. So what are they doing? This guy here is trying to get around and nuzzle the neck of this guy at the back. Okay. And so this guy is saying, I don't think so. And so it's pushing this, this other rat away. What you get is this rolling around as they each try to do it. They each take turns and so on. That's play if you're a rat. Uh, if you're a monkey, play is a little bit different. But here's something interesting. Here's a, a species of monkey that's called uh, tong, um, it's a Japanese macaque. And this is a Tonkin macaque. They look very much the same. The difference is that in this type of macaque, the play is one-on-one, -on -one, 
And in this type of macaque, it's in large groups. Think of the difference here. If you're playing with just one uh, of your um, playmates at a time, you can fight because you're, you're, you're uh, focusing on one another. What if there's six of you? I can't fight with you if somebody else might come and bite me. And so you're really aware of what's going on around you. And so these guys, it turns out, end up being really placid, sit around, oh, life's good. These guys are mean, nasty buggers. It's related to the play behavior. So if you can manipulate the play behavior, you can manipulate the later adult behavior. Why is that? It's because the structure of cells in the prefrontal cortex is changed by play. Play is a form of learning. So play is really important. Okay. Play is changed by exposure to psychoactive drugs, but play is also changed by having various forms of neurological uh, developmental disorders. And so what people do is they'll say, okay, I, my child has this problem or that problem. I'm going to shield them and not let them play with others. Wrong. You need to have this play behavior because this play behavior is important for pruning the cells in, in the brain. Early brain injury. Well, of course, early brain injury is going to influence learning. It's going to depend on where it was and when it was, how extensive it was, and so on. And you all are familiar with this. Media exposure, this is a good one. People will say to me, what do you think about kids watching Facebook? Kids on uh, media and so on. Well, here's an example. Uh, this kid's precocious. But the question is, what does it do? Uh, is this important for, for learning? And the answer is, yeah. So the American Association of Pediatrics um, suggests that children should not have media exposure prior to 18 months. Now, this is difficult. Uh, one of my grandchildren broke his femur when he was two, and you can't put a plate in a developing femur. You've got to, uh, if, for it to heal, you've got to put the kid in a body cast. Now, I want you to imagine a two-year-old boy in a body cast. He can't move his legs, the cast comes up to here. This is not going to be a happy kid. He was not a happy kid. Uh, he was in this body cast for eight weeks. So what's the solution? Well, uh, an iPad, of course. I said to my daughter, remember, this isn't such a good idea. And she said, you sit here with him. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to do that. So it, it's not so easy to have no exposure. There are lots of reasons. But the idea is to have minimal exposure up to age five. Incidentally, once he got out of the body cast, the iPad miraculously didn't work anymore. Um, and you should, the uh, association says you should have less than two hours daily uh, um, exposure af after that for the next two years. This is not easy, but we need to be aware that it's going to have effects. And the effects are reduced working memory, that is, re reduced short term memory in these kids. Language development is slowed down. Why is it slowed down? How much serve and return is there when kids watching uh, uh, an iPad five hours a day? Not very much. Um, slowed cognitive development, and you can see this at ages three to four. And remember those graphs I showed you with the developmental line of uh, literacy or grammar is going to be affected by the amount of time on that um, iPad. Um, that just tells you where you can find that. Okay, so you've heard a lot of things here. Let's extract some conclusions. Uh, one is that early experiences alter brain development, and they alter it in profound ways. Uh, these changes will influence the distribution in, in children without problems or problems, uh, wealth, personal opportunities, social privileges. But we can intervene. And we can intervene early and change the developmental trajectories and the life of children. So people will say to me, well, my, ch my child's having surgery for epilepsy, let's say. When should we start intervening? And my response is before the surgery, as soon as you can. So pre uh, surgical interventions, and then after the surgery again, pretty soon afterwards start in increasing serving return, increasing, I didn't talk about tactile stimulation, but tactile stimulation is one of the most powerful interventions you can, you can give. Now why would touch make a difference? I want you to think for a second here. You fall down, you scrape your hand, what do you do? You rub it. Why do you rub it? It feels better. Okay, why does it feel better? Well, I guess maybe the skin is making something that makes it feel better. Yeah, it's starting to repair. So you, you rub your skin and you produce compounds in the skin that make it feel better. Okay, so what? Those compounds in the skin are the same compounds that change the brain. So the one, my favorite, is it's called FGF2. FGF2 is produced in the skin, it goes in the blood, and it affects the brain. So you have a route from skin to brain. 
So why is that important? It means that tactile stimulation in infants, for example, is altering brain development, and we've got lots of evidence that that's true. So we know that we can intervene with massage and so on early on, and it's going to alter in a good way the outcome. In rats, for example, if we um, stroke baby rats, uh, they're like little Vienna sausages, so we just use a little paintbrush, stroke them, line them up like Vienna sausages and stroke them. Um, <laughs> for 15 minutes, three times a day, for two weeks, and then, and then take them back to mom. And then just let them grow up. And so we wait till they're middle-aged, and we investigate their cognitive skills, their motor skills, and so on, and guess what? They're superior, even though we didn't do anything else. So these early experiences did that. Well, what, about, what if we are worried that um, we're having uh, pregnancy problems and that we're at risk for um, some sort of nasty experience during um, birth? Could we intervene and, and massage the mum, yeah. And does that make a difference to the effect of that brain injury? Yeah, it does. And so, you know, w women are often doing this when they're pregnant. Well, what they're doing is they're making FGF, which is affecting brain development. So these, these effects are powerful, and they can be done uh, really early. So at that point, you've heard enough, and I'll stop and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you.